All right, folks. Time flies. It's time for the last part before we part. Part eight. Here is the story. You know, Timur and Ellen and Morten and I met in uh, the Netherlands in July, and then we went on to uh, Switzerland and gave talks. And then uh, they went off on vacation. I went back to work. I mean, <laughs> Timur went to uh, Bulgaria, Greece, Italy. Wonderful, right? And Ellen went to uh, Italy also. France. Oh, France. That's right. France. Uh, but I studied up on how to model cycles. So who had the best fun? <laughs> I knew nothing about that um, at the time that we parted. Uh, and uh, now I have uh, dabbled a little bit in it. I have no idea if my dabbling has any validity or correctness to it. Uh, these slides have not been certified by neither Tiermir nor Ellen. <laughs> So this may be totally wrong, but at least it would be fun to share how, how wrong they are, if they're wrong. <laughs> so let's see what they think. Uh, I think this top part is probably the most important one. Look at this. Have you seen data like this? Yeah, cycles. Uh, in the survey that many of you were so kind to answer, I noticed that many have applications where you expected cycles. So in this case, uh, I tried to uh, focus on 24-hour cycles, circadian or diurnal rhythm, such as heart rate. And this picture actually corresponds to something I've seen in the literature, namely um, IBI variation, time in between heartbeats. In between intervals is what it stands for. So if you look at it, <clears throat> Here, it's low. Uh, that's a time value 16. It actually corresponds to 4 p.m. So the uh, in-between is time uh, of heartbeat is low. That means that the heart beats very fast. So it's the reverse situation. So heartbeat fast, 4 p.m. in the afternoon when you're really stressed and you work all day and you're still not done. Uh, it has a high peak here, which is around 4 a.m time 28. Very long time in between heartbeats because you relaxed, you have slept until 4 a.m. and everything is good. So you have a 24 hour cycle here between the bottom or between the peaks. This is actually uh, obtained through M plus. This is through uh, M plus plotting. And The question is, how did I get these curves? And I'll teach you how. So this is what I studied. Uh, I have this Shumway Stouffer uh, book at home, together with a lot of other difficult-to-read uh, time series books. Even though they're very difficult, they only go up to n equals 1. But they're useful. And they have a chapter there on so-called so spectral analysis on these pages. And I also looked at that book, um, the uh, Intensive Longitudinal Data Analysis book from 2006 by Walz and Schaefer. And there's a chapter in that book as well on uh, cycles. So a very simple cycle is uh, written out here. A function of time uh, S with the uh, coefficients beta 1 and beta 2 multiplying variables x1 and x2 where the betas determine the amplitude and the phase of the cycles and x1 and x2 use these sinus and cosinus functions uh, which has this argument 2 pi times omega and then times the time variable. Uh, omega is a frequency index defined as cycles per unit so if you use omega 1 divided by 24 hours in the day, you get 0 0.04167 for a 24-hour cycle. For a while, I, I tried to make life simple, and I used 0 0.04, you know, half of 0 0.08. But then I ended up with 26-hour uh, days, so it didn't work on Earth, maybe on some other planet. <laughs> anyway, spectral analysis looked like a really fun topic. You know, it's trying to find the components of the cycles, there are sample um, 
uh, displays that can sort of give you a hint about cycles, uh, how many components are uh, generate them, and it's called periodogram. Periodograms. It's interesting. Uh, spectral analysis really untangles uh, a mixture of components like this. Actually, you can have a very long sum uh, to capture exactly the data. It's called you get to use these wonderful terms, Fourier analysis. I learned something. So what I did was to use M plus uh, simulations here. I have uh, uh, a two-step generating uh, approach. And I'll tell you why in a second. I'm going to do a cross-classified random analysis. I'm going to have 200 subjects at 100 time points. And the one means that just one person in the cell, as it is for a longitude, intensive longitudinal data analysis with cross-classified. I'm going to have a lag y variable. And uh, the model is uh, within y on y ampersand 1, a fixed autoregressive coefficient of 0.3 true value in the model population. And the variance on within 1 on across time variation is 0.5, and across subjects, 2. And the model command for the analysis is the same as the model population. What I want to do with this is something that you might find very useful uh, down the line when you work with uh, both real data analysis and simulations. And that is uh, uh, the fact that when you do a cross-classified analysis, you can save the data so that you get not only a time variable, but also, uh, so, sorry, not only a subject variable, but a time variable as well. And the time variable will be very useful to have for the second step. So second step then reads in the file from the first step where the, the uh, columns contain y and the time value and the subject value. And now I am able to create a data with these cycles. So you have the sinus, 6.28 is 2 times pi. And 1 over 24 is the omega. And then the cosine term as well. And I chose as beta 1, uh, 3, and as beta 2, 2. And I add that fluctuating uh, cycle part of the outcome to the y that I read in, the y on the previous slide, which was uh, autoregressive with variances on the three levels. Uh, I could have saved the data here and started over and had uh, the x values in the data set but I, I do do it in one run using define here. We'll see how I do it in the real data uh, setting shortly. So the, the trick is that I need to have that time variable, which you don't have, and you can generate it uh, from the first step of cross-classified analysis by using a cross-classified uh, model. So now, if I do this, uh, estimate the model with this estimate the data, rather, with the same model as generated it, and um, adding, or first of all, actually, in the first step, I did not add uh, any x variables here. I just had the y, y outcome here. So you see on between, I have the correct order regression. I have variation across subject, variation across time. I don't bring in the x val variables yet. I have fact factually a slow convergence but a time series plot of the between y factor score, the between time y factor score, shows these cycles clearly early on. And actually, the plot that you have, that I showed you first, is, is obtained from that. Now, if you want to model the cyclic trend, you take the same data and the same variables, and you can define, you can generate y here to have exactly the same y data that we considered before. But now you're also creating x1 and x2, the sinus and cosinus terms with the 2 pi times pi and 124, and times the time variable that uh, we created from the first step of the uh, data generation. And now I do that in a two-level analysis. And I regress y on y ampersand 1, so the order regression, and now also y on x1, x2. And I just have a between component for y there. And doing this, 
I get uh, the autocorrelation and the x1, x2 slopes very well estimated, converges in 17 seconds. Very nicely. So I can recover these kinds of pre uh, parameter values that I uh, use to generate the data by just creating two x values like that. So I recover the coefficients 3 and 2 very well in the estimation. I tried this, uh, I did this exercise because I wanted to learn about the, uh, the methodology before I dug into the data that motivated the study. And this is actually a colleague of uh, Ellen and Jan Hotwin from uh, the Netherlands, again the Netherlands. Uh, he works with heartbeat data among other things. He had 162 persons with the uh, time being maximally 38 hourly measures used here in this analysis, but I also used a version with quarterly, that is 15 minute intervals, so four measures per hour, and the results are quite similar. The outcome is this IVI, time in between heartbeats, high is good, and I related that to covariates of gender, smoking, smoker or not, and uh, participating in sports or not. That's described, uh, similar analysis of described in this paper from psychophysiology, although not using DSEM analysis. So here's the input for real data. I have the uh, cross-classified analysis here. I have cluster equals subject and time, as we want to do. And I want to use the uh, lag one for the IBI measure. And time interval is one here one hour, and the uh, x1 and x2 variables are defined here. Of course, we don't know what the coefficient should be in the real data. And what I do here, I do a random uh, autocorrelation and a random variance for the outcome. This is the real data. And between subjects, I regress the uh, random coefficients, the three of them, on the background variables, sex, sports, and smoker, which come from, uh, which are um, between level variables. Subject level is sex, sport, and smoker. The time, on the time level, we have x1 and x2. They vary across time only, so they come in in the between time part. So you have the uh, heartbeat, in between heartbeats, uh, regressed on x1 and x2. So this is real data, folks. We don't know how this is going to go. Nobody's seen this before. Least of all, Hotwin. Well, no, he actually, I showed him this. So, okay, here's what it looks like. This is real data. First time point is 8 o'clock in the morning. And here we find the low at 2 p.m. That is low, a short time between heartbeats. Your heart beats very quickly. So. Uh, in real data, in these real data, people look like they're most stressed out at 2 p.m. My simulations assume 4 p.m. That's more like how I feel. <laughs> and the uh, peak of IBI, that is when your heart is the calmest, is at 5 a.m. I assume that 4 a.m., but these data say it's 5 a.m. So you have then the, the lows here, 24 hours apart, 2 p.m., 2 p.m., that's how it came out. We can do cycles, folks. So, what are the model estimates? Well, the between level, between time level, IBM on the x and x2 uh, coefficients, or variables rather, that have to, have to do with the sinus and the cosinus part. You have, uh, this is the beta 1 and this is beta 2. And both are significant. They're very small here. I don't know quite what scale one should think about this in. Uh, but what's most interesting is between subject level in this case. So here's the level of the heartbeat. That's regressed on sex, and that means gender in this case. Take your time. So uh, I think it means that uh, males, uh, females have a lower time, shorter time between heartbeats than males. For some reason, I don't know. It's significant. Sports uh, people uh, have a, a higher time in between heartbeats. That, that seems like it's good, right? And smokers have a lower 
uh, time between heartbeats. Not good to be a smoker, I guess. And here then, phi, the autocorrelation coefficient, is significant for smokers. The smokers have a significantly higher autoregressive coefficient. And so then the substantive research would have to try to figure out what that means and if that's predictive of something in real life. And the variance is significantly influenced by, being, by uh, engaging in sports, uh, significantly higher variation in uh, IBI, and smokers have a significantly lower IBI. So presumably not good to be a smoker. Now I analyzed this also um, on the uh, quarter level, so to speak, and the results held up pretty well. Uh, it took about one hour, it's not too bad. I found that I made uh, one uh, poor choice here, and you can see this here. This looks suspicious, a high fee variance. Uh, that, that's usually much lower. So what I did, what I, what I, did, what I didn't think of at first was between time, uh, this has to do with between time variance, right? Between time variance of phi. And it's very, sh we do allow the, the autoregressive phi coefficient to vary across time. It's possible. But I think you have to have very long time series for that estimation to go well. So I decided, and it's not gone well here, so I decided to fix the mean of phi, no, sorry, fix the variance of phi at zero here. So you can say phi at zero. That's what I did in the second time around analysis to uh, not try to model that because it went, went haywire. What happened? Well, that variance, of course, disappeared, but everything else was quite stable. Stayed pretty much right the same. So it didn't matter in that regard, but at least I cleaned up the results a little bit. So I don't know, but um, this may be uh, a beginning to uh, a little piece of your tool bag, a little building block that you can use in your analysis when you have cycles. And all kinds of interesting combinations of model pieces can be used. Um, I'll let you think about them for now. All right. That was one thing I did while the others were on vacation. The other thing I did was two-part DSEM. <laughs> that is, I, um, I was analyzing the smoking urge data from uh, Saul Schiffman, as I mentioned. And uh, belatedly, I looked at the distribution of the data, like a real data analysis. <laughs> uh, and I found that this is what it looks like. Early on, after they're trying to quit smoking, early on time-wise, we have 27% at the floor value. This looks like a sensor distribution, right? Sensor modeling to work here, for those of you who were here Wednesday. Late, 47% are, are at the floor value. Overall, 42% at the floor, floor value. Strong sensoring. But the interesting thing is what happens over time is that more and more people move up into the low part here move into the zero uh, value, no smoking urge at all, as the time goes on after, after they quit, try to quit smoking. So there's a movement of this part to the left, but mostly they move into the zero part there. So that sort of tells you we shouldn't really use a simple linear model as I did all day afternoon yesterday. Perhaps we should do something else. So um, <laughs> we went to uh, Switzerland, Zurich, and we sat down there at the cafe for the International Meeting Psychometric Society. And we had some Swiss fondue, of course. And after a while, the ideas started pouring forward. Everybody said, OK, we got to do this. We got to do that after having a, I think it was after our workshop, right? Yeah. Anyway, you see the napkin here. And here's, 
what came out. Tech one to formulas. Now we're giving away the secrets for the next version, right? <laughs> and this is Ellen's um, hot topic. She wants M plus to show the formulas of the model, like, for instance, MLWIN and HLM do. You know, what's random, what's fixed, and. <laughs> no, you don't. Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, okay, good. That's a good. Um, we, we can take your vote. We had votes in Utrecht too. They wanted everything. <laughs> and then, what, what about this? What's that uh, shorthand for? Well, actually, Tiermer uh, skirted on that, uh, touched on that. Uh, that is, why stars mean uh, the latent propensity for answering in a categorical variable, you know. Y star behind a binary or a ordinal variable. And he said, in passing, he said today that we don't have that yet and we should really have that. Well, we said that already at that dinner. And then we had this little drawing here. Mostly Tiermer and I drew that one and uh, Ellen didn't like it, as usual. <laughs> uh, what prompt means it, it will be I revealed later on. Workshop in Sweden, some specific plots of slopes, fit measures, and then I blurred out the bottom so you won't see it. <laughs> anyway, this is what I focused on to try out a little bit. So for the smoking data. So I, I, I thought about, well, from Wednesday we talked about two-part modeling, which is a way to handle censored variables, which smoking urge certainly is, and many other variables certainly are. They have a very high frequency of people at the lowest value and then they taper off or they go down and then have a normal curve. We can do two part, data two part to transform the variable into two variables, a binary for being at zero, being at the floor or not. And if they're not at the floor, we have observed values for the continuous y. And, but if u is zero, that is we are at the floor, then y is declared as missing. That's a typical two-part modeling that we showed the regression and mediation version of uh, on Wednesday. And I'm going to use that. A probit model for u and a log normal model for y is the defaults. And I'm going to go by the defaults because actually it, the log normal looked pretty good. Now if you look at the uh, overall here, uh, this tail, this, you take the log of that to move in the tail, it becomes more normal. And it goes down here and then up. It wouldn't be as good if that one was up here, if it was like a drop like that. Maybe then you should have a power law uh, distribution or a Pareto distribution like they do in econometrics. I don't know how to do that. I and mean, that's actually a hot research topic. But I did uh, this. I did the log normal version. So here is two part decent. So for a certain time point, I have the binary u and the continuous y where y is missing when u equals zero. And the question then is how are you going to deal with the, uh, the uh, order regression? Where should you put it? And how are you going to deal with the covariates? So if you look at the covariate part first, uh, obviously we have some kind of a trend here because we have time here and we have negative affect as a time varying covariate. And we have random coefficients here. What I did was I think Tiermer meant this also. Uh, I put the autocorrelation on the factor, on a factor that's indicated by u and y. So the idea is that you have a factor tendency towards um, the smoking urge. And uh, it, how, when it changes, it, it influences the probability of being at zero or not. And then if it's not at zero, it influences the value of y. It doesn't have the same strength of influence on the two. You can estimate, you can fix that to one and estimate that loading, for instance. And I decided uh, to, to get the autocorrelation on the factor level instead on, on the observed level. Well, we don't even, we're not even able to do the autocorrelation on the observed level here. But you're saying then that uh, this influences those two proportionally. And the autocorrelation here is relevant. So this is like a DAFS model here. You could have the autocorrelation up for the indicators, like I said. And then on top of that, you're saying that time and negative affect influences the factor. 
not the u and y directly. That has to do with those different cases that Tiemer talked about, how the covariates play in. You could have time influencing y differently than influencing u. If you have a lot of x variables, the fact that it goes through the factor means that the coefficients for u, the influence from these to u and y are, are proportional. But anyway, this is a very simple model that I tried. I actually tried it for first without the time part. Uh, and, and it actually came to a, a believable result, but after a very long time, like 20 hours. <laughs> and that's long even for me. And perhaps that is because uh, you have a very weak, in, weak set of indicators for the factor. U is binary and Y is approximately half missing. Because in, in principle, I did simulations to show that uh, if you have two continuous variables or even two binary variables that have no missing, that is not doing two-part modeling, this kind of model can work well, including having a, a random residual. So here's what I did for this two-part DSM model, ex uh, except for the time. Uh, I created data to, in, data the two-part data outside of the um, analysis. I did that in a previous run. So I have the variables uh, u and positive. This is the uh, continuous y variable. This is the binary one. And I even brought, I brought, tried to bring in the, the final model that we had before, including the quit uh, distal outcome, which is binary. And this is a two-level model, so the cluster is subject. And I work with that time QD, uh, time interval delta value, TMR talked about 0 0.08. And uh, the model then is F by, the F factor is measured by U and positive, you know, corresponding to this model, very simple. And F exists in a lag form, lag one. So I do phi bar F on F and percent one. And then, and then I have SYX, F on negative affect, this being, I dropped that, I didn't have the time, like I said, but this, random. And uh, the factor, vari factor residual variance random as well, corresponding to that dot. This, this picture is the within level model. All right, that's it. And here's on between, I have all of those uh, intercept, the random intercept for positive and for the binary U. It's a random continuous variable on the between level. V, SYX, log V on female age. And then quit on those as well. This worked. Although, like I said, what was it, 24 hours or something? Or more. But that run takes a very long time. And the run where I include time to do the random slope for the trend, which was predictive of quit in the analysis I showed yesterday afternoon. It never converged, no matter what I tried. It, the PSR stopped, just went down to two and kept spinning and spinning and spinning. Uh, I went up to 30 hours and it never went anywhere. Often that's a sign of non-identification, but I thought about it long and hard and I couldn't see why it would be non-identified in principle. It might be empirically poorly identified because of having a binary and a only half observed y variable. So I actually tried to simplify it. I discussed it briefly at the end, just before we left with TMR, and it suggested fixing that lambda value to one to make it simpler, but it didn't help. Same thing, same thing happened. So we end with a failure, and I want to show you that this happens, <laughs> and it's okay. So we still have to solve the problem of this and of this, uh, it's an outstanding research project. And preferably, it should be uh, an approach that handles not only this case, where that bar is lower than that, but also handles the case when it looks like a J here. But right now, nobody knows how to do that properly, not even G4, as we call ourselves. <laughs> But it's a step in, in one direction to try, at least. Finally, and finally for today, right?
multi-level time series analysis in, in the air, I claim here. That is, we spent uh, more than two years on working on this uh, at a time where uh, there wasn't really any methodology uh, that we could draw on. It was not like people have written papers for exactly how to do this and we could just program it. It was a bet on these kinds of data becoming very frequent in the future. So it was a wild bet, a big investment, and I worried that it wasn't going to be the right thing to spend two years on. There are so many things on our to-do list that have to do with much more bread and butter issues. But I thought it could be worth a try, and Tim was totally in favor of it, and of course Ellen was excited. So we like to say, you know, if you build it, they come. We built it, but will they come? Well, there are some positive signs, and one is that we saw uh, in the spring that NIH in the U.S. Uh, put out funding opportunities, encourage a research projects that seek to explain underlying, underlying mechanism and predict health behaviors with individuals over time utilizing intensive longitudinal data, both for individual um, researchers and also for research centers as far as I understand. So that's interesting. They're interested in it, at least from the data collection point of view, which means that one day they will come and ask, well, how do we analyze this? And personalized medicine, this just came out in biostatistics a few weeks ago. Personalized medicine, the FDA, they claim here, provocative statement, is unprepared for the new world of personalized medicine. Consider what's possible now that nearly everyone carries with them the processing power of a 1990s Cray supercomputer. Smartphones, monitor blood pressure, e ECGs, and even analyze DNA. Does anybody analyze DNA here? No, yeah, okay. Anyway, so that's the second positive sign. And the third one, the high registration numbers for our summer workshops. In Utrecht, we had 130 registrants. For Baltimore here, for these two days, 233 people registered. Not everybody came. About 175 came for this day, about 200 came for the first day. But that signals an interest among students also wanting to be on the research frontier. And a very strong interest in time series analysis at uh, the Psychometric Society meeting. I've never seen so many talks on uh, intensive longitudinal data. So it's in the air. And you were kind enough, to, some of you at least, um, and some uh, uh, individuals in, for the Utrecht workshop to give me responses to that little survey I sent around. And now you're going to get to see the results. So uh, I ask these questions. Do you have a plan to collect intensive longitudinal data? What's your data collection method? N and T, time points per day, fixed or random, substantive area, primary outcome. Do you expect trends and cycles? Do you have experience with analyzing RLD? So now you get to see the results. Okay, have or plan to collect ILD data? Yes. Uh, most people did, otherwise they probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> Sampling method? Well, ecological mom momentary assessment uh, method seemed to be uh, the most prevalent, uh, followed closely by diary data. And sample size? Well, that varies quite a lot. Some have less than 30 or less. Many have 100 to 200, even greater than 200. Most of them do. Number of time points seem to be a little bit on the low side, less than or equal to 30. And you know now with Morton's new rules, you should have, first he said at least 25, but then when he started non-random effects distribution, he said at least 30. So maybe 30 should be a good thumb, rule of thumb. I'm, I'm just being bold here. He said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there you have it. Uh, but many people have, or, or it's, Substantial number of people have over 200 time points. And I've heard of that today too, particularly with physiological data. Time points per day, one per day is very common, but several uh, are common. Fixed versus random, mostly are fixed, but many are random. Area of study, physical health, mental health, tobacco research, alcohol research, general psychological uh, distress measures, and others. Trends versus cycles, trends over time, but also cycles, which I thought was interesting. 
And that's why I wanted to take a look at whether or not we can do it. And finally, do you have ILD experience? No. <laughs> so, but now you do, right? At least you have experience with hearing about methods that you might want to try to use. So with that, folks, this is the end of my little talk. But now we have some leftovers. So I invite up on the floor Ellen Hamacher. Just to recap. <laughs> yes, so, yep. All right. Let's see. So, is this working? Yep. All right. So, as you may or may not remember, um, I ended yesterday with talking about a multi-level um, factor analysis um, with, at the latent level, at the within person, um, a uh, autoregressive model. So this is what it looks like. Let me see if I can get all the pointers and everything. Right. So. We had 10 indicators for positive effects, so like energetic, happy, proud, and everything. They are decomposed, each one, into a between part and a within part. And then the within parts are used as indicators for a latent variable, which is the um, state positive effect. And this state positive effect is then mo uh, modeled as a latent uh, AR1 process, so it's regressed on the one yesterday. The autoregressive parameter is random, and also the innovation variance is random. There's measurement error variances here, but they are not random. I mean, that would, I think, blow up the program. Um, so at the between level, we then get the within person means from the decomposition, and we use these, so we can think of these as the trade scores, use them as indicators for the latent variable, which is then trade positive effect. We have the autoregressive parameter as a latent variable, and the random, uh, or the log of the, uh, you know, the random log of the variance. I guess that's the way to discuss it. So what I was interested in is, okay, so this, this dimension, that, this underlying dimension that is being modeled here is the underlying dimension that describes within-person fluctuations. It's like the dimension on which a person fluctuates over time. Whereas this factor model here describes the stable between-person differences. It's the underlying dimension that describes stable between-person differences. And the question I was interested in here, and I've been interested in, is basically related to all the work that Cattell was doing, questioning whether the within-person structure is the same as what you get cross-sectionally. And cross-sectionally, you get a combination of within and between. So what I wanted to know is, is within the same as between? That's basically what I'm asking. So is the, when, when we think of my, positive effect fluctuating over time, is this occurring at the, on the same dimension as the dimension on which we can describe stable between person differences between all of us here? That's basically the question. So are these factor loadings the same? That was my question. This was the way to set up the model. As I've said, you know, there was a T missing here for the measurement error. I just want to make sure that you scribble it in. The question is, are these factor loadings here the same as the factor loadings here? And so the, the, the way I would, I tried to do it in the beginning was to first specify a model without constraints on the factor loadings, get the DIC for this model, 
then run a model in which I constrain the factor loadings across the levels, get a DIC for that model, and then just compare the two, because then I could tell which model fits better. But as I said before, um, when I was trying to do this, I wanted to make sure that the DIC I got was actually a good, stable DIC. So I tried the same model, but with a different seed, and it turned out to give me a completely different DIC. So that was not very encouraging. So even though all the trace plots looked really beautiful, uh, the, the, the PSR. PSR, thank you, yes, <laughs> nice and stable, close to one, um, everything looked really good. Uh, the parameter estimates of the two analyses with the different B seed would be like, you know, the point estimates would be spot on, the same. But the DIC was still like 100 or even more points different. So, and yeah, that's not useful. So, of course, then Tiomi is saying, well, but then the difference between the two models could be even a lot bigger. Of course, if then the difference between the two models is 1,000, you might still decide that the model that results in lower DICs, you know, is to be preferred. But in this case, this was not the case. Maybe because the factor loadings are the same, that could be the conclusion. But uh, yeah, I was just not, not happy about using the DIC here. So what I did instead was just compute the difference. So the difference between the factor loadings for the same indicator at the between level and the within level. So I, here I named the factor loadings at the within level and at the between level. So for the state and for the trait. And then here I computed the differences between them. And then I figured, so then at each iteration of the MCMC algorithm, you're going to have a, an estimate of this difference, or a, a, a draw, or a, a number for this difference. So you get a posterior distribution, and then you can see whether zero is inside of it or not. So that's what I did. And these are the results. And I have to say that this, the, the top line is slightly um, shifted. So uh, the, this should be like the estimates is here the estimate of the difference, this is then the posterior standard deviation, and so on. So what you see is that five out of um, 10 factor loadings, or maybe we should say nine, because the first one was used for scaling, but five of the nine differences have a, a, a conf or a credible interval, I should say, that uh, does not contain zero. So that would indicate there's differences in those factor loadings between the within person and the between person model. So that would be, the conclusion would then be, there is no uh, equal factor loadings for within and between. Um, I have to say that this, of course, depends completely on which indicator you use for scaling. So this could use, look very different if I use the second indicator for scaling or the last one or whatever. So it's not, um, yeah, it's, it's an, an area that's not really clear how to best proceed. I mean, it would just be nicer if we would have a DIC. Basically, that's the bottom line. Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, here is a plot with the factor loadings, the estimated factor loadings, for the younger and the older sample. So the younger sample is in green, older sample is in purple. As you might remember, it's the Cogito data based on two samples. First indicator was used for scaling, so all the factor loadings are one. The, lighters, the lighter bars are for the within part, and the darker bars are for the between part. And then you have to try to make sense of this. Yeah. So. And realize that if you would use a different item for scaling, that everything would look different. So the one thing that I found striking when looking at this is when we just focus on the purple bars, so the ones for the older sample, we see that for most indicators, within has a higher factor loading than between. You see it here and here, 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 but not for this one. It's like complete opposite uh, pattern. And that is the item proud, or stolz in German. So that's interesting to see that for the uh, older sample, they respond very differently 
in terms of their fluctuations, um, uh, within person fluctuations in positive affect and how this is related to how they answer this question and uh, how this is related to the other indicators. Um, when we look at the standardized results, we can uh, get the uh, R-square, both at the within level and between level, for these indicators. So this in, uh, gives you an idea of how much uh, variability is common to the, the indicators at each level. And you see that here, the amount of variability that is common to the indicators is much lower than when you look at the trade level. So you would say that there is quite some uh, random measurement error, whereas there's very little systematic error in these indicators. As you re might remember, I said that the residuals at the between part, they're unique to the indicator, but they don't vary over time. So you can think of it as systematic error, whereas the residuals at the within level vary within a person. They're unique to the indicator, so that's random measurement error. And the other thing that you can look at, of course, are the correlations at the uh, between person level between the latent variable. So it's called TPA here, trade positive effect. Uh, I called it positive X effect between in some of the slides also. Um, so it's correlated with the phi parameter, the order regressive parameter. We see it's not very, uh, it's actually not related but it is related to the innovation variance. So it's negatively related. So people with a higher uh, trade level of positive affect tend to have less innovation variance at the state level for their positive uh, affect. And when you look at the relationship between phi and the innovation variance, we see there's also a negative relation. So people with a, a higher phi parameter tend to have less um, innovation variance. So again, this is then uh, to the substantive people to make sense of this and um, whether they can uh, come up with a good reason or whether they actually can come up with uh, expectations in advance to doing these analysis. That will be even better. I was interested also in uh, exploring a bit of the plots. Uh, um, Theomir has been showing this as well. But what we see here are uh, plots. Um, they are based on the between level measurements or the between level um, estimates. So of the trait of the phi parameter uh, and also of the innovation variance. And then you can also make scatter plots between those. So this is basically related to the correlations we saw in the previous slide. So you see that, for instance, the correlation, negative correlation between the phi parameter and the innovation variance. So you can get the number of the correlation also when you right click and choose something. Another thing that you can look at are the um, factor scores. So this was also shown by uh, Theomir already. Um, and what you see here, so as you, you see the, the cluster with the highest factor score, I'm looking at the phi parameter here, so the, the, the autoregressive parameter, and you see that, the, that the, the, the highest estimate is actually one. So that would be a non-stationary process. And then the second one is 0.999, so that's very close to non-stationary. The thing that I uh, did here in the next slide was actually focus on this person here, who has actually the lowest phi parameter, so one, uh, Point 13, sorry. And this is the sequence plot of the estimated latent uh, variable. So uh, each person then, the, the, the thing we saw bef in the previous slide is the phi parameter, which is an estimate. We have an, uh, an estimated phi parameter for each person. But then at the within person, uh, for the within person process, we also have an estimate for each person for each time point of their latent variable, the, the state positive effect. And that's what we see here. So this looks pretty nice, I think, uh, when, when you think about what a, a time series process could look like. 
there are some weird parts here where you go like, okay, what's happening here? There's a lot of scores that are, that there's very little variability and then there's some variability again. And then there's like a few places where there's very little variability. Well, if you look at the plots that contain the observed variables, and here's just for three of the indicators, remember there's 10 indicators, you see why this is the case. It's actually because there's missing values there. If there's missing values, as I said, you know, it's going to predict the next score based on the previous score. It cannot update it, so then it's just going to keep it. And then it's doing this. It goes towards the mean of this person, which for this within person uh, latent variable is going to be zero, more or less. So this is what it looks like for person 22. And then I just looked at the next person in the, in the sample, I think. And then the latent score looked like this. Then I was less happy. <laughs> because this does not look like a nice AR1 process, right? So what was happening for this person? Well, this is what the observed data looked like. So I think this is also a, a, a research area, like what should we do with people that have data like this? Oh. So of course, uh, one option would also be to consider, and I've been treating the observed variables as if they are continuous. Uh, that's my default. Um, but uh, so maybe it would be better for these indicators to be treated as uh, categorical or ordinal. But even then, I think you will find these people that have very uh, little variation in their scores compared to other people, like the previous person, who has much more variability in their scores. So should we just throw all these people out? Uh, should we have a special model for them? Uh, or should we just consider this as, okay, this is, this is a useful model to just find this underlying, uh, these underlying factor scores, but we should not interpret this person as having a AR1 process at a latent level. It's just a way to describe the data rather than as a way to find out something meaningful about the person. I don't know. So I think this is something that uh, we will definitely see more developments uh, over the next few years. But now we can see. One thing that I also considered was, um, okay, we see these people that have five parameters very close to one. Then we say it's not a stationary process. Um, some people have argued that if you have a five parameter close to one, maybe you should actually look at an AR2 process rather than an AR1. So that's why I wanted to look at this as well. So I have the decomposition here like before. I forgot T here like before. <laughs> so you can include that one for the epsilon. But now you see that at the latent level, I'm not only regressing on yesterday's positive effect, but also the day before yesterday, so T minus two. So this is an AR2 process at the latent level with 10 indicators. And then at the between person level, I now have the latent mean for the, um, oh, this should be a T. Oh, this is getting worse and worse. <laughs> All right, this should not be SPA, but TPA for trait positive effect. Um, and that has a latent mean, so that's, that's or a mean, so that's the, the, uh, what the eta is about. And then you have uh, phi one and phi two, and then the log for the uh, innovation variance that's allowed to be random. So I, I, I ran this model, it's very easy to do in, in M plus, and I uh, obtained the uh, factor scores, make the scatter plot for phi one and phi two, and then right click and save data, and then read it into R, and make this nice little new plot out of it. And what I add, so here you see the parameter estimates. So uh, on this, on the x-axis, we have phi one, the first uh, autoregressive parameter. So for today, regress on yesterday. Here we have phi two, it's today on the day before yesterday. And um, here are the parameter estimates. So the crosses are the younger sample and the circles the older or the other way around. And what we see with the triangle here, that is actually the triangle based on uh, certain well-known formulas from the time, ser uh, time series literature that indicate where an AR2 process is stationary. 
So if your parameters fall inside this triangle, the process is stationary. And as I'm saying, there is a curve. You can't really see it. Well, I can, I can but you can. it's here. Yeah, there's a curve here. If the parameters are below it, you will have this oscillating process, which I showed also in one of my first slides for an AR2 process. And if it's above it, like these people are, then you don't have this oscillating process. Still an AR2 process, but it behaves very differently. Anyway, so you see that you still get these people that are really on the bound of the stationarity constraints, and I'm pretty sure that these are actually the same people that also had a phi parameter very close to one for the AR1 process. So just extending it to an AR2 was not solu a solution to this uh, problem, if, if you consider it a problem. So that was the end of my uh, sec or my fifth application, actually, but um, my second attempt at it. <laughs> um, I wanted to mention a few little things, uh, just in general. So uh, just summarizing strengths of uh, DSEM in M+. So compared to the standard multi-level software, where you just, just are using a regression model with one outcome variable, one of the ad big advantages is that now we can have multiple outcome variables, so the bivariate models or more. So that's, I think, a huge uh, uh, advantage. We can allow all the residuals to be correlated, so the in innovations, but also to allow for all the uh, random effects to be correlated. The other thing is the unequal time intervals, which is standard in ESM studies. We can handle them by choosing a certain grid and inserting missing values. Missing values are not a problem. Um, we can have outcomes at the between-person level, so that's what we've seen in those mediation models. So we don't only have predictors for our random effects, but we can use our random effects also as predictors of later outcomes. The person means centering uh, as an integral part of, of model estimation, where we call it latent mean centering. It solves Nichols bias. There's people that get very, very excited about that. Um, then uh, latent variables, of course, as I've just shown in the, in the application. That's also something that you couldn't do with the, the standard uh, uh, multi-level software. Cross-classified models, of course. Random variance, which is also, I think, a very important uh, step forward in this modeling. And of course, the standardized coefficients, which I forgot to mention here, but that's also, I think, one of the super strengths of DSM in M+. I want to mention that I think all of the models that we are doing here, at least in theory, you could also do them with free software like Winbugs or Jags or Stan. And we, that's the, the kind of software that we have been using you know, before <coughs> DSM was developed. So the advantage of M+, over these software packages is that it's much easier to use because of tailor-made code. I mean, trying to teach those models, with, for instance, just a univariate model with a random innovation variance and a random AR parameter using Winbox to other people would be a real pain. <laughs> um, default priors in, in M+, uninformative priors, that was also one of the topics that we really studied because one of the issues is that the variance of the phi parameter is very small, typically. That's because the phi parameter itself is restricted in range, in a sense. So it has a very small variance. And what is considered uh, an uninformative prior for variance terms, in general, actually becomes very informative for the very low values of variances. So that's, you know, we, we did a big uh, simulation study on that, actually to find uninformative priors for those small variances. Um, and it seems that this is not really a problem in M plus at all. And of course, it's much faster than um, many of the other programs because it, it's specifically made to solve these problems and not Bayesian problems in general. So that, that makes it much faster. So the future, um, besides the wish list, <laughs> Um, and this is not happening in a vacuum, um, so there are many other developments, many other people working on uh, programs uh, to do this kind of dynamic modeling. So uh, the ones that I know of uh, are, for instance, MLVAR, 
uh, CTSAM, OpenMX, and Dinner. These are all functions uh, you can run in R. And then there is standalone software, Baum and Gimme, also um, uh, doing different kinds of uh, dynamic models. So it will be interesting to see in the near future comparisons between those programs and uh, how uh, DSEM in M plus is operating. So if that's something you're interested in, that would be definitely something that you could do a simulation study on and then send it to M plus to post on the, on the website. That would be good. Um, so in the future, as you've already heard, we will have regime switching models, uh, which is also very exciting um, and, and it's going to be a very um, valuable extension of what we are looking at here. And then, of course, the residual dynamic modeling, as uh, Tiomi was discussing. Well, and then the dots, I mean, yeah, you've seen the wish list. I have, I have some wishes, but we'll see what happens. And these are the suggested readings. They're just suggestions, but um, if you have a specific topic that you would like to get suggestions on, then you can always email me, and I'll see if I have any suggestions for you. Yes, that was it. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for your contribution. And now as a final step, uh, Tiamir will come back and do his remainder. And then we will take questions at the very end. So I'll just take a couple of minutes, um, really. It's just to uh, finally show you that uh, uh, model that uh, you can do to um, get three level autoregressive um, models. So again, um, so the, the idea here was to actually um, kind of explore uh, the possibility to model the autoregressive parameter on the within level uh, and on the between level. Uh, excuse me, on, on within day and between day. Um, so consider this uh, simple simulated example. Um, this is no, it's okay, no worries. So um, let uh, y i d t be the observed value for individual i at day t at time t. And um, we're interested in this model. The dependent variable is an intercept parameter, individual specific intercept contribution, um, individual specific effect for an individual at time t. So that will be uh, kind of like the, uh, um, for a particular time of the day, for a particular individual. Uh, that will be the uh, contribution for uh, the day, for each day, and then this will be the residual within day um, at a particular time within the day. Um, so that will be the within level uh, version. And we can have an um, autoregressive uh, process for this within the day effect, and then a separate autoregressive process for the uh, between day effect. Um, and the, this this model is uh, kind of interesting because of uh, the fact that it resolves uh, this issue that we talked about earlier about how do you actually treat the um, uh, the the the, pro the process that uh, has to be reset overnight, and perhaps it doesn't belong to the same process, and the level of autocorrelation uh, will be different when you can separate them um, like that as a um, overall for the day day effect for the whole individual, and then within the day, the, uh, the noise within the day that happens within the day. So, um, so again, we get these two separate uh, autocorrelation parameters. Um, and this is a very simple model, actually. It just has uh, seven parameters. You have the four uh, variances. So these are the these residual variances. The, 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 uh, then you have also the variance on the uh, between level and the variance of also of that factor. Um, we have just uh, two autocorrelation parameter and the one mean parameter. So we generate data using 100 individuals um, observed for 100 days with 10 observations per day. Um, and uh, the trick here to, uh, because we don't have um, three level model um, developed yet, so we're going to convert uh, one of the levels to a wide format, which is something you can always do. Uh, this data, and because there's uh, 10 observations within the day, when we convert the day observations um, in a wide format, basically uh, 
instead of having a one dependent variable, we're going to have 10 dependent variables. And here's a little picture that represents the model. Uh, so um, I had 10 observations within each day here, but uh, just to uh, have a more reasonable uh, plot diagram, we just have five observations within a day here. And so this is um, basically the between day. Um, this is the day specific effect. Um, and that's the individual specific effect. And you have that autoregressive, and this is for just for two days. And these are basically the um, effects within the day. And you have an autoregressive process within the day here. And that's for the second day. And that's the second autoregressive process. Uh, so, um, and this, of course, continues on and on in this way. So, let's see how you, how you can do this uh, in N plus. So, Again, we, we have actually t these 10 variables, so the, the, we, because we convert this to a wide format. Uh, and uh, th this uh, uh, creates the um, effect, uh, the day effect. So you can see the loadings are all fixed to one, and it's the same effect for all the 10 variables within the day. Uh, then we create these factors behind each of these um, observed variables. And we can create the autoregressive process simply by regressing each of these factors uh, on each other. So there's a command that um, is a shortcut for creating this. Um, so F2 dash F10, uh, this command is called uh, is PON, PON, pairwise on. So basically, it's a shortcut for F2 on F1, F3 on F2, uh, and so on. So this basically creates um, the um, autoregressive process on the, uh, with, within the day. And you can, you know, this parameter, this bracket two basically means that it holds this parameter, this own regression to be the same uh, between all these, um, uh, all, between all the factors, this regression parameter, which is basically, this reflects just nine regression statements and all of these uh, are held equal. And that's basically the autoregressive parameter within the day. Um, and uh, here we hold some other parameters equal just uh, so this, yeah, so that they are the same uh, within the day. Uh, on the between level, uh, we, we're going to have, again, fixing all the loadings to one. Uh, uh, and this is basically the uh, individual level contribution, the individual level intercept. And, um, and that's basically the uh, uh, other uh, effect, which is the um, within uh, person time specific effect, which is there. Uh, so this model is fairly easy to actually estimate. I, I did it several times, actually, as uh, we kind of uh, weren't quite sure <laughs> if, it, if we did it the right the first time, but it works quite well. And here are the results. Uh, you can see this, the parameter estimates are unbiased, and the coverage is uh, quite good. Um, for, for all the parameters, and you get this, um, the, uh, this is basically the autocorrelation parameter for uh, between day, and um, um, this is the autocorrelation parameter within the day. So uh, one more push on this front is um, what happens if you actually want to uh, have uh, individually specific times of observations within the day, that essentially would be the same model but introducing missing data between the observations. And um, so you can just add to the um, simulation that I described earlier, just uh, add random missingness between these variables. And uh, the results were not quite as good. And uh, you know, it took actually also a longer time to actually estimate this model. They're fairly, um, they're not far away from the, uh, what they're supposed to be. Uh, but because of the uh, uh, vast amount of missing data, I believe, is uh, what's causing the, um, uh, it, I probably I need to run this even longer to get to eliminate these biases. But uh, uh, perhaps, um, you know, the model becomes um, uh, complex enough that uh, um, they're be pushing the limits of the amount of missing data that we can accommodate. Anyway, the results are not uh, too far away from where they're supposed to be. So. Um, and yeah, this is kind of the list of the new uh, where we're heading. Uh, so this, some, of, this, some of these models are 
you know, where what uh, is being uh, worked on is this residual DSM, uh, which we're kind of finishing up, and uh, uh, as I'm going back, I'll work on this, uh, on uh, accommodating residual DSM models with uh, random slopes, which we don't ha currently have, but some of these models are actually already done, we just haven't finalized them, but they're uh, probably on their way soon to uh, be in release version. So this is uh, Bayesian multi-level mixture models are already available. Uh, Bayesian multi-level latent transition models with cluster-specific transition probabilities. Um, that's, that's in our paper also. Uh, um, dynamic structural equation, um, multi-level mixtures of dynamic structural equation models is something that uh, Ellen has a paper on. And, um, she showed us uh, the models that uh, she thinks are interesting and some of these are already implemented. Dynamic latent class analysis. Uh, hidden uh, multi-level hidden Markov models, multi-level Markov switching autoregressive models, which is the kind of the combination of all this, uh, and the multi-level Markov switching DSM models. So the kind of um, various stages and kind of sort of debugging and uh, kind of making sure that it's ready to go. So, um, and uh, that's the end of my thing. So yeah, we can. Yeah. And that's the end of the whole thing, folks. You survived it. Congratulations. Congratulations. And before you all leave, I wish you good luck with the analysis. May all of your runs converge. <laughs>